Okay, guys. Do me a favor again. Put everything on your desk. You should have your notes or paper out. To participate, you should be taking notes, and you should have your notes or paper out, right? Okay. All right. So. All right. So let's just look at uh, a general situation that's going to show up in a lot of application problems. Um, again, this is going to be you know in words that the rate of change of some variable, like y, for example, is directly proportional to the value of y itself. So again, the rate of change of y is directly proportional to y. What's another way of writing the rate of change of y? Well, dy over dx. But if y is a function of t instead of x, then you'd write that as what? dy over dt. So isn't that the rate of change of y in this problem? And it's directly proportional to um, y. And so you write equals some constant times y. Let me explain that. Let's go back to Algebra 1 for a minute. When you learned, when you learned about um, direct and um, inverse variation, problems started out, and again, these are like word for word from you know, Algebra 1. y is directly proportional to x. When you read that, what did you write? That y is equal to what? Some constant k times x. Isn't that what you did back in Algebra 1? Yes? Well, it's no different here. So in this case, what it's saying is that the rate of change, which is a derivative, is directly proportional to, in other words, equals a constant times y. So can you read something like that and write that differential equation? Okay, that's the first step. Well, we still got a long way to go, but that's the first step you got to get, otherwise you're not going to get very far. Does that make sense? Okay, so what's next? All right, now what if you separate variables and solve? Okay, and again, since y in most applications is going to be a quantity, a quantity typically can't be negative, and so just know that in a lot of these problems we're just going to assume y is positive. It's not really a big deal, but anyway. So what I did is I separated variables, right? Again, where does it, um, and then after that, I, I moved the y to the left side. And again, where does the k go? k is a constant, so which side should I put it on or leave it on? Yeah, the right side, right? The t side, because in this case, the t side is kind of like my x side, and I, right? Because remember, in the end, you're going to try and solve for y. So you want to keep the y side as simple as possible, and you can help do that by putting any negatives or constants on the other side. Are you with me? Yes? Sid, with me? Okay. And so now what? Now comes a step where I integrate both sides. And again, um, the antiderivative 1 over y, dy is ln absolute value y, but I'm not even going to worry about the absolute value because y is going to be a positive quantity anyway. Got it? Again, you can put it in there. Not a big deal. You can put it in there if you want. Um, and then at that point, how do I finish solving for y? I do the what? Do the what? Do the, do the E thing, right? Sounds like you can write a song called Do the E thing. But anyway, so that's what I'm going to do. Got a pass? You want me to grab yeah, one? you need one, okay? I mean, I let it go last time because it wasn't, you know, very long and the weather was bad, but uh, it's too long today. All right, but anyway. So anyway, after you raise each side as the power with the base of E, the E and the LN drop out here getting you to this step. And then on the right side, I broke that up into a product like I've been showing you for the last week. Um, and then I just switched those. And again, in this case, um, I know you don't have the plus minus e to the c, but you're only worrying about you know, positive quantity anyway. And so again, you can just replace e to the c with c. Okay. All right. And you guys, do you remember that PERT problem, or that PERT equation from uh, pre-calc that helps you figure out the principal on a certain investment at a certain interest rate? Do you remember that? This is the same thing, okay? So you can kind of relate it to that, okay? Um, but the bottom line is this. We started with this. First of all, we started with a word problem, which we wrote a differential equation for. And then we solved that differential equation. We got this as the general solution. So what I'm saying is, from now on, when you read something very, very, very similar to that, 
you can write that, and you then can skip all this. So again, when you read a word problem that starts out with this exact type wording, you can write that right away and then skip all these steps and then go to this. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what we're doing first today. And again, this is all summarized in this box here. So if you start out with a word problem that fits that differential equation model, you can skip all the steps and get the general solution of that, right? All right. Now, any questions so far? All right, now let's go back to the fact that y is a quantity, okay? And so if y is a quantity, how do you talk about the beginning amount of that quantity? How? Well, the beginning is time equals 0, right? And so if you put a 0 in for t, doesn't this just simplify to y equals c? So what that means is at the beginning, at time equals 0, the starting quantity y equals c. So C is the what? Initial or what? Starting value on these application problems. Does that make sense? Okay, and then K is going to be the proportionality constant, which, again, in this case, what's going to happen is you're going to be starting out with a quantity that's either growing or decaying, okay, exponentially. And so K is the proportionality constant, which is the relative decay rate or relative growth rate. And um, what does the K tell you? Well, if the K is positive, that means you've got exponential what? Growth. And if K is negative, you've got exponential what? Decay. So those are the, all the things you need to know about uh, this type of scenario. Does that make sense? All right, now let me show you an example. Ready? Here we go. Thank you. All right, so here's an, one type of example you're going to have to apply this with. Okay, right away, the rate of change is y, y is proportional to y. So as soon as you write that, or I'm sorry, as soon as you read that, what are you going to write down? The rate of change of y, and again, what are the variables this time? y and t. So the rate of change of y would be what? dy dt, and that's what? Proportional to, in other words, some constant k times what? y. And then if you separated variables and solved without going through all that, you know the solution will always be what? Y equals what? C e to the what? KT. Are you with me so far? Yes? All right, now what? Well, the goal on this now is to find the value of those two variables right there. If you can find those two variables, you'll, have, you'll be able to write your equation, and then you'll be able to answer all kinds of questions about the scenario. But the goal is to find C and K now, if you can. Are you with me? All right, so what do you know? Well, you know when T is 0, Y is 2. And when T is 2, Y is 4. So at some point, you're going to put those into this equation. Now, which one do you think you want to put in first and why? Which one of these two pairs of values do you want to put in first? The one with 0. Because by putting in 0, things drop out, and you're able to quickly solve for one of the variables. Does that make sense? So definitely put this one in first. All right, so when I do that, what do I get, guys? Um, well, don't I get 2 equals C e to the k times 0? Which gives me what? What's e to the 0? 1, and so you get what? Right away you get what? C is 2. And so now I want you to update your equation with that C value. I should be writing this down. Okay. And now we still need to find what? Still need to find what? K. And so let's bring that up here. So now we're going to put in this ordered pair, aren't we? Following? OK. OK, it's just kind of like a puzzle. You've got to put all the pieces together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a 4 in for y, and at the same time I'm going to put a what? 2 in where? For what? For t. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by 2 to cancel that out. And that gives me this. Now what? How do I continue solving for k? You tell me, quick. Take the ln of both sides. 
and then multiply by a half or divide by two. Everybody agree? Yes? All right, so then your final equation is what then? Y equals what? 2 e to the what? ln of 2 over 2 times what? T? Okay. Okay, so once I found K, I just stuck it in there, and I got my final equation, Y equals 2 times E raised to the power of ln of 2 over 2 times T. Can everybody read that? I know it's kind of small, but... Is that okay? All right. All right, and now, once you have that, like if I give you the time, you could plug it in and then figure out the new quantity at that time, right? Or if I give you a new quantity, you could stick it in for Y and solve for T, and that'll give you the time it takes to reach that new quantity. Does that make sense? Okay? Yes. Well, you could, but I mean, again, at this point, I'm just going to probably be using a calculator and plugging in a value for t or y, and so it really doesn't matter if you simplify it too much more than that, okay? In fact, in fact, I might even want to get a decimal there and stick it there. Got it? And so um, I might as well do that. Uh, do I want to do that? Yeah, why not? So if you get your calculator out and you do ln of 2 over 2, sorry, where's that line? There it is. I get what? 0.34657. Remember, you want to carry a lot of decimal places on these. I mean, normally I say round your answers to three decimal places, but. You don't want to round to three decimal places too early. So again, on this, I'd probably suggest you carry five, five decimal places. And so I'd probably write this as 2e raised to the 0.34657t. OK? Make sense, guys? And then again. If I give you T, you could plug it in and quickly get the new quantity at that time. Or if I give you a new quantity Y, you can stick that in and solve for the time it takes to reach that new quantity. Do you understand what we're going to be doing with this equation now? Now that you find C and K, it's ready to go? Yeah? All right. All right. Now, let's look at another type of problem you're going to have to deal with. And again, you've probably, or some of you have probably seen this in some of your science classes. Okay, when we talk about radioactive materials and radioactive decay, we measure it in terms of half-life situations. And, and so what's a half-life when something's decaying? Well, a half-life is the number of years it takes for half of the atoms in a sample of material to decay. So for example, the half-life of plutonium is 24,360 years. And so what, what that means is what? If you start with any quantity, stay, Okay, whatever quantity you start with, it'll take that many years for that amount to naturally decay in half of its starting amount. Does that make sense? That's what a half-life is. Okay? Got it? Okay, so that's a long time. All right, but anyway, in such situations, okay, the rate of decay, which in this case will be dy over dt, will be proportional to the amount present, y. And so doesn't this fit that scenario I've been talking about all hour? Doesn't it? Okay, and so we can write dy dt is equal to ky, which has a general solution y equals ce to the kt. So anytime it talks about a half-life situation, you can use that. Got it? Yes? Or anytime it talks about a, you know, a radioactive material, you can use that. Okay. All right, now the time you can't use y equals ce to the kt is what I'm going to talk about next. Okay, this is another example of how you can apply calculus in science. Newton's law of cooling, okay? Okay, Newton discovered that the rate of change in the temperature, which I'll use capital T for temperature and little t for time. Is that okay? Everybody understand then where I got dt over dt? Big T is what? Big T is temperature, little t is time, okay? So the rate of change of the temperature with respect to time of an object is proportional to the difference between the object's temperature T 
and the temperature of its surrounding, which we'll call T sub S. And so based on that statement, we should be able to write the following differential equation. Are you ready? <coughs> the rate of change of the temperature, dt over t, t, dt, is directly proportional to, in other words, k times what? The difference. What difference? Between the temperature t and the what? The temperature of the object t, I should say, and the temperature of the surroundings, which is t sub s. You see how he took Newton's law and wrote it as a differential equation? Now, it, that's not the same. That's not the same as this, is it? I mean, not, it's not that the variables are different. What's the main difference? Not, not necessarily the variables. That's OK. What's, what's different is what? That here you just had the quantity. In this case, you have the difference between what? The, the quantity or temperature and the temperature of the surroundings. So it doesn't quite fit, does it? And so what I'm saying is you will not be able to go right to the y equals c e to the kt solution. So what you're going to have to do on a problem like this is do the separation of variables and, and get its solution on its own. Are you following me? Do you understand everything on this page before I turn the page? I mean, I, I can't you know, make it any simpler than that to understand. So hopefully you guys got it. Any questions? OK. All right, so with that in mind, let's go to the next page and do some examples. And I know I gave you an entire half page on each of these. You're still going to have to write small to fit it all in there. I'm just warning you. OK? In fact, I'm going to go to a whole piece of paper for me so I don't have to write so small. OK, so here we go. Example four. If you don't have this and you want to pull it up on Moodle on your phone, at least so you can look at the problem, I'm, I'm OK with that. OK, but I'll put it up here for just a minute as we read it in case you, you can't do that. OK, so what are we doing here in example four? Well, this is the next example, isn't it? Yeah. OK, so suppose, did I do three examples? No, something's wrong. I think my numbering just got messed up. There's nothing missing here. We're good. OK, um, so suppose 10 grams of plutonium isotope uh, PU239 was released in the Chernobyl nuclear accident in the year 1986. How long would it take for those 10 grams to decay down to 1 gram? And again, this is a situation where we're going to have a half-life for this material, right? And I'm just giving you, I'll give you the half-life. Okay, I'm telling you, the half-life for that material is 24,360 years. Okay, and so are you ready? Okay. What did I say? If Y is the amount present, But I was going to do a separate piece of paper, right? So here we go. If Y is the amount, the amount present at time T, okay, um, then what can we say in this case? That the rate of change of the amount with respect to time is directly proportional to, in other words, k times the amount present y. Got it? And without going through the whole separation of variables, I know my solution to this will be what? y equals what? c e to the what? k t. Are you following me? All right. Now, OK, so you started in the year 1986 with what? With what amount? Yeah, with 10 grams. In other words, <coughs> this, by st starting with that amount, you're talking about time equals 0, right? The beginning, time equals 0. So at the beginning, at time equals 0, you know y is 10. Are you following me? Yes? All right, now, what else do you know? The only other thing you know is that what? The half-life is what? The half-life is what? 24,360 years, yes? OK. So that's all the information we have, yes? All right, so what are we going to do now? Well, it says, how long will it take? So you know this, that's a fact. You know this, that's given. And you want to find what? What are you trying to find here? It says, find how long, in other words, find the time when what? 
when the new amount y equals what? One gram? So do you understand everything that you have and what you want to find? Yes or no? Okay, so just by reading that one or those two sentences, I was able to write all of this information down, and now we're ready to start the problem. That's what you're going to have to do. These are going to be all word problems. You have to pick out this kind of stuff and then go from there. Not easy, is it? Well, you get the hang of it after I do a couple, but are you, are you okay with what I wrote up here? All right, so here we go. What do we do first then? Any ideas what I'm going to do first? Go ahead. Yeah, substitute this in there, right? In other words, you're going to put in 0 for t at the same time you put in y, uh, 10 for y. Are you following me? Okay, good. All right, what's k times 0, guys? 0. And what's e to the 0? 1. And so you get c equals 10. By the way, didn't you kind of already know that? Didn't I say in these problems the c will be the starting amount? Didn't I say that? So you kind of already knew that, but mathematically that kind of pro proves it, doesn't it? Okay, so anyway. So once you find c, I want you to update that equation and write y equals 10 times e to the kt. And then again, remember, your goal is to find c and k. So I found c, now I need to find what? K. And how am I going to do that? Well, isn't that when I'm going to use the half-life situation? In other words, I can say what? What's another way of saying that? The new amount, y, will be what? Cut in half. What was the starting amount? 10. So that 10 will cut in half down to 5 when what? When t equals what? 24,360. Isn't again that what, isn't that what the half-life means? However much you start with, that, that amount, that starting amount will be cut in half. So you go from 10 grams down to 5 grams after that many years. That's what a half-life means. Okay with this so far? And so that's what I'm going to put in next. So that's going to go in here next. Are you ready? Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, so you understand I'm going to put in these values for y and t now and go from there to hopefully find k, okay? All right, so what should I do first now, guys? You tell me to solve for k. Quick, quick, quick. Divide by 10, okay? Okay, now what? Take the ln. Okay, then what? Yeah, do you divide by the 24,360, right? All right, so get your calculators out and punch this in. Divided by what? 24360. Alright, so what do we get, guys? What in the world is that? What in the world is that? Negative 2.8454 e to the negative 5. What's the e to the negative 5? That's scientific notation, isn't it? That's like times 10 to the negative 5th power. So what does that mean? You need to move the decimal point what? Five places to the what? Left. Does that make sense? Okay, so then that means k, again, I'm rounding, so k is about, let's see, negative point, how many zeros? Four <coughs> zeros, and then the two, eight, four, or two, four, five, I should say. Yeah, two, four, five, four. Yes? 
Again, notice how I carry five significant figures there. Not necessarily five decimal places in this case, but five significant figures. Is that clear? Yes? All right, so now that you find K, update your equation one more time. So if I update this, I'll have Y equals 10 times E raised to the negative 0 0.00002854 times T. All right. Now that's the equation. I don't think I've answered the question yet, but at least I think I have the equation that will now allow me to answer the question. Do you agree? Yes? All right, so here we go. All right, so what was the question again? To find T when what? When Y is 1. So, again, if I wrote that down earlier. We need to find the time t when the new amount y is 1 gram. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a 1 there. <coughs> Let me do it over here. I don't want to run out of room. Bless you. Okay, so here we go. Um, put a 1 in for y. We're going to get tired of writing these decimals by the end of the hour, but oh well. Okay, so what do I do first to solve that for t, guys? Quick. Divide by 10. And then what? What's next? Take the what? Ln of both sides. And then finally what? Divide both sides by that nasty decimal. Yes, Kevin with me? Yeah. All right, so at this point, get your calculators out, punch this in, and you'll have your answer. I like to cheat so I don't have to retype it. And then what? Divide by what? Negative point zero 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 two eight four five four. Okay, so would you agree that's the uh, number of years it's going to take for those original ten grams to, to decay all the way down to only one gram remaining? Do you understand? And that's what we just found. Okay, so there it is. So 80,923.072, what is this? Years? Whole page of work, huh? Good? That was only one example. Ready to do another one? All right. Here we go. All right. So let's look at example five. I'll put it up here for people that don't have it. Okay. All right. This time... We have a population of fruit flies that increases according to the law of exponential growth. So suppose there were 100 flies present after the second day, and then you knew that there were 300 flies present after the fourth day. Approximately how many were present in the original population? All right, so let's write down what we know, okay? Well, first of all, well, in this case, y is the quantity, so y is what? Number of what? Flies, right? And t is the number of what? <coughs> Days. Are you following me? Okay, and so again, let me write that down. Okay, and what else does it say? It says that uh, the population follows the law of exponential growth. What does that mean? That means the rate of change of the number of flies with respect to time is directly proportional to, in other words, equals some constant k times the number of flies present. 
at any time. You following me? And again, with, if I separated variables and I solved, what would the general solution be? Skipping all the steps, what would it be? Y equals what? C e to the what? KT. Okay, are you getting the hang of it? I mean, it's the same scenario every time, isn't it? It's just different quantities we're talking about. Now, something changes, though, in this problem. What changes? Well, you'll see. What do we know? What else do we know? That what? When what? When time is what? Two days, the number of flies y is what? What? 100. What else do you know? When the number of days is what? Four, there were how many flies? 300. Okay. And by the way, what are we trying to find? It says, find the number of flies at the beginning. In other words, find y when what? Time is what? Zero. Okay, so everybody understand? I got everything I need written down here. And now it's just a matter of putting it all together. Sam, are you with me? Okay, we good? Again, you guys are real quiet. Does this mean it's going okay? I mean, I'm trying to explain it the best I can. Is this, is this okay? All right, so what are we going to do first? Now, here's the problem. Normally, we'd, we'd look for the one that has a zero in here and stick it in first, because that would quickly allow me to find C. But I don't have that, do I? So that's going to complicate things. And so basically what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to use these two pieces of information to write a system of two equations. And once you, write, once you write that system of two equations, I think the easiest way to solve it is just to use substitution like you did back in Algebra 1. Do you understand how this is going to be a little bit more complicated? Yes? All right, so here it goes. All right, so if I stick this in there, what do I get? Quick. 100 equals what? C e to the what? k times 2, or 2k. Are you with me? Okay, then if I stick this into there, what do I get? What do I get? You should probably even draw those arrows so you remember what I did when you look back at this later on. Okay, so when I stick that in there, what do I get? You tell me. Uh, what do I write, Sam? Yeah, 4k. Okay, thank you. All right. And so basically, at this point, you've got a system of two equations with two variables. So the easiest way to solve this type of system, I think, is just to use substitution. So what you want to do is you want to solve one of, the or one of the equations for one of the variables and then substitute that into the other equation. Isn't that what you learned back in Algebra 1? Yes? All right, so what's the easiest variable to solve for, C or K? C. Everybody agree I'm going to have to do that to solve for C? Okay, so once you solve one equation for one variable, you're going to now stick that into the other equation and continue. Yes? Is that what you did back in Algebra 1? So let's do it. That's going to go right there, isn't it? Okay. And so what I'm now do is divide both sides by 100, and that's going to give me 3 on the left side, isn't it? Yes, if you divide both sides by 100, you get 3 on the left side. And over here, you're left with this, aren't you? And again, can't you combine those using an Algebra 1 law of exponents by subtracting the exponents? And that turns into what? E to the 2K. Now what? Take the what? Ln. And then what? Divide by what? 2. And so again, at this point, um, let's see. I, I, do I want to leave it like that, or do I want to change to a decimal? I don't know. Let me, let me put it into the equation, and then um, we'll go from there. OK, so now update the y equals uh, c e to the k2 stuff, right? And again, there's probably other ways you could do this. <coughs> okay, so at least we have uh, K now. And again, I could get a decimal for that 
I can either do it now or later. It doesn't really matter. Stay with me. And now how am I going to find C, guys? How am I going to find C now? Well, if you want, you can plug K in right there and get it that way, right? Yes? Couldn't you? Or you could what? Right? Wouldn't that do it? Like if you, if you plug this into here and then... Let's do that. You could see equals 100 over what? E raised to the 2 times what? K, which is ln of 3 over 2. And so don't the 2's cancel, and don't the E and the ln cancel, and so you get C is 100 thirds. Everybody agree with that? Yes? See how everything dropped out nicely if you left it as ln of 3 over 2? You could have put a decimal in there. It's fine. I think this is a little bit easier, though, right? Everybody see what happened there when you stuck it in there? Again, I'll say it again. All he did is replace K here with ln of 3 over 2, and then the 2's canceled, and that left me with E raised to the ln of 3 power, so the E and the ln dropped out to just 3 in the denominator. Catch that? All right. <coughs> Stay with me. And so at this point, um, put that into here, and you get this. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. Now, what are we trying to find again? I forgot. Now that I have everything I, I need, I'm trying to find what now? Well, yeah, I'm trying to find C. Or in other words, I'm trying to find the, the amount Y at the beginning when time equals zero. Wasn't that the question? So now find Y at T equals zero. And again, that is the same as finding C if you think about it, isn't it? And so if I stick in a zero there, watch what happens. What's zero times that mess? Zero. zero. What's e to the zero? One. And so you get y equals what? A hundred thirds, which is about what? Thirty-three flies at the beginning? Yes? Anybody got that? Question? <coughs> Everybody agree a hundred thirds is about thirty-three flies? Shunhee, you with me? Yeah. You sure? Okay. Pretty nasty problems, aren't they? But I'm trying to do a variety of things for you so you'll be prepared for just about anything. All right, so those two examples are like the problems you're going to have in the book. Um, this is another book problem. And then I think the last example is an, uh, an example off an old AP exam. Okay? So we got two more and we'll be done. Are you ready? Okay. Newton's law of cooling. Okay, suppose y is the temperature of an object in a room whose temperature is kept at a constant 60 degrees. So they're going to keep the room at a constant temperature of 60 degrees. Okay, what do we know? Well, we know that the object cooled from a starting temperature of 100 down to 90 degrees in 10 minutes. And then we want to know how much longer will it take for the temperature to go down to 80 Okay, and so, again, why are we using Newton's Law of Cooling? Well, Newton's Law of Cooling stated what again? That the what? Well, Newton, Newton's Law of Cooling talked about how the, the um, temperature of the surroundings affects the temperature of an object in those surroundings. Isn't that what Newton said with this law? And so isn't this a scenario where you're putting an object in a room at a constant temperature and therefore we should apply Newton's law of cooling to that scenario? Does that make sense? All right, so here we go. And again, I'm going to do this on a separate piece of paper so I don't have to cram it in there. All right, so... Y is the object temperature, right? Yes. And um, the room temp is what? 
What's the room temperature? It's always going to be what? 60 degrees, yes. Now, obviously, I have to let the object temperature be the variable y because it's going to change, isn't it? Isn't the object temperature going to change? But the temperature of the surroundings is not. It's always going to be 60, right? Okay. All right, so here we go. Newton's law of cooling says, in this scenario, the rate of the change of the object's temperature with respect to time, in other words, dy dt, is directly proportional to, in other words, some constant k times what? The difference between what? The object temperature and the what? The surrounding temperature. So does everybody agree that that's a differential equation we have to start with in this problem? Sammy, is that making sense? Now remember, because there's y minus 60 there instead of just y, I cannot go right to y equals c to the kt. It won't work. You understand? I cannot go right to y equals c to the kt like I did in the first two examples. I'm going to have to actually do what? The separating of variables and solving for the general solution. Do you understand where I'm going with this? All right, so what am I going to do? Separate variables. All right, so you tell me. What do I do? Quick, multiply both sides by what? Well, first, first separate the variables by multiplying both sides by what? dt. And then what? What's next? Quick. Multiply both sides by what? 1 over y minus 60. Okay, where does the constant k go? On which side? On the t side. So everybody agree I'm good with the separating of the variables? What's next? Integrate. Okay, what's the antiderivative of k dt? Come on. kt plus what? C. And on the left side, you're going to need a u substitution, aren't you? You're going to let u equal what? Okay. And then what's the derivative of that, guys, with respect to y? Quick. 1. And then if you play around with it, you get du is dy. Correct? You with me on that? All right, so putting it back in, now I get the yeah, antiderivative 1 over u, du. Everybody agree? Yes? All right, I'll slow down. What is the antiderivative 1 over u, du, guys? What is it? ln absolute value of u, right? Plus c, but I already got the plus c on the other side, so I'm good there. All right, then don't forget to put your u back in. That would be the y minus the 60. Okay, continue. How do I continue solving for y so I can get the general solution? Quick. Do the e thing. Yes? And then, by the way, I should split that up into the product, right? e to the kt times e to the c. Everybody agree with that? We've been doing that now for every day for about a week straight. Yes? Then what? How do I get rid of the absolute value? Put a what? Plus minus on the other side. And by the way, is it okay if I put the e to the c first? And what did I say? Anytime you see that, you just replace it with what? Any real number c? Yes? And then finally, what do I do? Add 60. And finally, guys, I have my what? My what? General solution. All right. Now, so it's, it's, it's kind of like y equals e to the kt, but obviously I've got that plus 60 in there as well. Got it? Now, let me tell you something. I want to know. You've got to say that C is not the original temperature. So again, the only time where C is the starting amount or the starting temperature is when what? When you have just what? Y equals what? C e to the kt. So if you have anything else in the equation, C is no longer the original amount. Is that clear? Okay? Understand that? All right, so, all right, so here we go. What else do we know, guys? I never really wrote down what I, what I know and what I'm trying to find. I never did write that down, did I? 
right, so let's write it down. All right, what do you know, guys? At, at t equals 0, what? The, the temperature y was what? Come on. 100. Wasn't that the starting temperature at the beginning at time equals 0? And then what else did you know? At time equals 10 minutes, what was the new temperature y? Come on. Come on, guys. 90. And what are we trying to find? We're trying to find what? The time at what? At y equals 80, isn't that? So isn't that everything? Yes? Good? All right, so what are we going to put in first? This is the one with the zero. Are we going to put in the one with the zero first? Okay. Oops, so you're going to put in 100. 100 equals... C e to the k times 0 plus 60. And by the way, what is k times 0? Zero? 0. And what's e to the 0? 1. And then, obviously then, so c is what? If you subtract 60, you get c is what? 40. All right, so once you have that, I want you to update this equation. Okay, updated with the C, and now I need to find K. So what am I going to use next to find K, guys? Yeah, I'm going to do this, right? Replace nine, nine, Y with 90 at the same time, you're going to replace T with 10. Okay. Now what? Now what? Come on. Subtract 60. Now what? Divide by 40. Now what? Take the LN. Now what? Yeah. Divide by 10 and you get K equals uh, LN of 3 fourths divided by 10. <coughs> yes? Which is about what? Divide by what? 10. Okay, and now that you have K, what's your final equation then? Y equals what? What is it? Y equals 40E raised to the negative 0 0.028768T plus 60. But agree that's the equation now I need to answer some questions about the scenario? Yes? Again, so well, every time I find C and K, do whatever you got to do algebraically to find C and K. Yes? You mean the y equals c to the kt plus the, uh, the temperature of the surroundings? Yeah. Yeah, just don't, don't expand it beyond that, okay? That's only for Newton's law of cooling, not other scenarios, right? Yeah. Okay. We're getting there, guys. I know this is grueling, but we're going to be done sooner than you think. All right, so now that I have the equation, I don't think I've ever answered the question, did I? So, this is example six continued. All right, so now that I have my equation, I think I'm ready to finally answer the question. What was the question again? Yeah, find the time when y is 80, right? When the temperature y is 80, so here we go. So put the 80 in there, right? All 
Um, then get tired of writing this decimal. Quick, now what? Go. What do I do first to solve for t? Go, go, go. Subtract 60. Then what? Divide by 40. That gives me a half, doesn't it, on the left side? Then what? Ln. Yes. And now what? Divide by that decimal. And punch it in your calculator, right? Okay. And then divide by negative point zero two eight seven six eight. <coughs> and so what are the units on this? Time is in what? Minutes, days, hours? <coughs> minutes in total, right? It's gonna it's gonna take that many minutes from the start. But it, what, the question was how many more minutes after the first ten minutes? So that would be what? This is how many minutes total from the start it'll take to go down to 80 degrees. So, yeah, so after the first 10 minutes, it'll take another 14.094 minutes. Does that make sense? Okay? Good. Pretty nasty, isn't it? Okay. Um, now, again, we have one more problem. It's an AP problem. And then we're done. And then uh, you've got, you only have five, no, six book problems, and then three AP problems for homework. So you have only a total of nine problems like this, okay? All right? All right, so here we go. All right, last problem. All right, I'm going to call on somebody, see what you learned today. At time t, the radius of a circle is increasing at a rate directly proportional to its area. Again, we're not going to solve it. I just want to, this, all I'm doing here is giving you a little bit of practice on writing the differential equation. I think we can all easily finish it from there by separating variables, but I think we need some practice here of writing the equation. So actually, why don't you all take a minute or two and write down what you think the answer is to A, and then we'll, I'll call on somebody. Okay, so everybody write down what you think the answer is to A. You're not solving anything. You're only doing the very first step, which is writing the differential equation. Go. Write it down. Read it and write an equation and stop. Okay, you should have the answer. It should only take you like 10 seconds. All right, so how about... I don't know. All right, Faith. What do you think it is? Um, is it like dr dr? Exactly. Everybody agree? dr dt is equal to ka. Isn't that what you'd write after reading that sentence? And then from there, you can just separate variables and solve. Right? Doesn't this say that the, the radius is increasing at a rate. Again, the variables, right, are R and T at the beginning, right? So dr dt, the rate of change of the rate with respect to time, is directly proportional to, in other words, equals some constant k times its area, right? Now, again, I know you kind of have more than two variables there, but that is the correct scenario, isn't it? Yes? Okay. But the good news is, to get it down to two variables, what, you could, what could you do? Yeah, substitute in what? Pi r squared for the area. Yes? And now you're back down to only two variables, and now you'll be able to separate the variables and solve. Does that make sense? Okay, guys? Can you do something like that if this, that was a question on the AP exam? And then just solve it from there, whatever the case may be? 
All right? Try the next one. This one's tricky. This one's tricky. Remember, both those 8 and the square root of t plus 1 have units of what? Gallons per minute. So those are your what? Your, those should be part of your rate equation, right? Part of your differential equation. Does that make sense? You see how the units tell you what it is? Okay, so see what, see what you can put. There's no directly proportional to here, is there? Does it say anything about proportional to? Does it? No. So you better not have a K in there. Doesn't say anything about proportional to anything. So I don't want to see a K in there. All right, let me ask you this. What are my variables? Gallons would be what? Volume. Isn't gallon volumes? Volume? Yes? Okay, so you got the variable A, and you also have the variable what? T, because you have gallons per minute. Minute is time, T. You understand? So gallons is volume, and minutes is T, time, right? Okay, so... Who, who thinks they have it so I don't have to call on somebody? Okay, Sam. Okay. Okay, DV over DT. That's right. The rate of change of the volume with respect to time is positive 8, right? You got a positive 8 rate of change. And then a minus square root of t plus 1 rate of change. So it's going up at that rate down at that rate. Didn't we say this all year long? When you got a positive rate of change, it's the quantity's increasing at that rate. We have a negative rate of change, the quantity's decreasing at that rate. Haven't I been saying that all year long? Yes? And so that should make sense. So it's 8 minus square root of t plus 1. Good, Sam. Thanks. All right. All right. Now, we're going to go a little bit further with C, but at least let's see if you can write the first step. So see if you can write the differential equation. Okay, for C. And be careful. It's not talking about directly proportional. It's talking about what? Inversely proportional. So you have to think back to Algebra 1 again. When I say Y is inversely proportional to X, when, you said, when we said that back in Algebra 1, what's the first thing you guys wrote down? Y equals what? Y equals K over x instead of k times x. Do you remember that? Yes? Isn't that what inversely proportional means in general? Yes? So kind of think of that related to something you already knew back in Algebra 1 and then see if you can figure this one out. Man, it feels like I've been talking a lot longer than an hour. It's actually only been about 55 minutes, but it feels a lot longer. So here it goes. Ready, guys? All right, what are our variables here? What are my variables here? What we're talking about 
points on a coordinate plane, right? And we're talking about x and y coordinates then, aren't we? Of point, point P, yes? You understand? We're just talking about variables x and y in this case, right? On a coordinate plane. And so who has the equation? Oh, thank you. So does somebody have the equation for me? Anybody have it? Somebody has to have it. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, hold on. Go slow so I can check it because I don't have the answer yet. Okay. Slope with a curve. Okay, so I, I agree. dy, dx. Okay, yep. You mean the other way around? You mean k over y? Right? It's the variable y that has to be flipped, not the constant, right? In order for the variables to vary inversely. Does that make sense? Okay? Yeah, that's it. Everybody agree that's the differential equation here? All right, and so let's solve it. How do I solve it? Go. Because this time it asks you for the equation, so you need the original equation y equals, yes? Okay, so what do I do? Separate variables by doing what? Multiply by dx. Again, this is an old AP question if you're wondering. Okay, now what? Multiply by y, okay? And have I separated variables correctly? And now I'm ready to what? Integrate. And what do I get? y squared over 2 plus c, but I'll put the c on the other side later. What do I get here? Quick. kx plus c. Everybody agree? kx plus c. All right, now what? Continue solving for y. Go. What do I do? Multiply by 2. And then take the what? Square root of both sides. Now be careful. Technically, you're supposed to put that. And so now here's a dilemma that's come up before, and I'm not sure I've ever addressed it as a whole class. I know I've addressed it individually with students who have come up in class or during seminar and asked me about it. So the question is now, um, when I start putting in these points here in a minute to find my my k and my c, and obviously I'm going to put this in first, you're going to run into a problem, aren't you? You're going to have to decide whether you use the plus or minus maybe, aren't you, at some point? And so to avoid that, let me make a recommendation. Don't go to that step until after you've what? Found the what? The c and the k. And then you can go to that last step. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem deciding whether to use the plus or minus. Is that clear? Yes? So on that scenario, instead of dealing with that, it's easier just to back up and plug these into here to find the values of C and K. Okay, so here we go. So what am I going to have? 4 squared equals what? Quick. If I put this point in there, what do I get? 4 squared equals what? Come on, guys. Help me. 2K times what? 0 plus what? C. And so you get what? C equals what? 16. And so where do I put that? I put it what? Into here? Yes? All right. Now use what? Now use this. Yes? So you get what? 8 squared equals 2 times k times 1 plus 16. Everybody following what I'm doing here? Okay, now what? You tell me. Go, go, go. Hurry. Subtract 16 and then divide by what? 2. You get k equals 24. All right, and so where's that going to go now? That's going to go into here. Update that one now. Yes. Do I leave the plus minus in there? Can I take it out? What do you think? What do you think? Well, remember, your final equation better what? Make both of these come true. Correct? 
So if I put a 0 in there, what's the only way I'm going to get positive 4? If I put a 0 in there, what's the only way I'm going to get positive 4 for y? Is if I keep only the what? Plus. Same with that other point, 1 comma 8. The only way it's going to work if I only, is if I only keep the plus. Yes? And so instead of leaving that in your answer, I want this. I only want the positive one because it's got to satisfy the initial conditions. Understand? When you run into that dilemma, which one you do or whatever? Yes? Pretty nasty, huh? All right, I'm done.